Welcome to Not This, Not That, where we push our boundaries of understanding and perception. I am your host, Reverend Patricia Caginello, and I invite you to join me as we open to the possibility that things may not be exactly as you believe, as you've been told, that there could be more, that in our collective consciousness is the potential for the all. You can find Not This, Not That on sacredstoriesmedia.com and on Apple Podcasts and all streaming services on the Sacred Stories Podcast. Today, we are continuing our four-part series with New York Times bestselling author James Redfield to expand our boundaries of understanding on the 12 insights that comprise the Celestine vision. The first nine insights are from James' bestselling book, The Celestine Prophecy, and the 10th, 11th, and 12th insights from his follow-up books to the series, the 10th insight, the secrets of Shambhala, and the 12th insight. Last episode, James went in depth on the first three insights, and today we are speaking on insights four through six. So welcome, James Redfield, to Not This, Not That. Thank you, Patricia. Nice to be with you again. This is fun. Yeah, absolutely. So James, the Celestine vision you describe as the potential for a life marked by a higher spiritual connection. And I believe it's a beautiful roadmap for us to navigate what is currently happening in our world. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think that what is happening out there is a uh, renewed interest in spirituality. And uh, uh, all of our challenges out there uh, are about uh, probably wake-up calls, uh, waking up to... Uh, a different uh, attitude toward life, a different consciousness about life and, and, uh, and all of its aspects. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we're blessed to be uh, living in a time when so many uh, scientific explorers out there have moved from just the physics of the materialist uh, idea of the world uh, to start to really put their logical thinking and their, uh, their, their seeking of all the phenomena that we run into in life and exploring those. You know, we're, uh, we have a new science of what I would call spirituality that's happening out there and has been for, you know, 20 years or so. Yeah. Um, and it's, that is letting us apply all the princ- the good principles of science, which is, you know, uh, define the phenomena uh, for what it is and how it looks and in all aspects as you can. And then, to, then, uh, then look at that phenomena in a way that uh, tries to see how it fits in with life, with human life, uh, you know, what's going on. So, when we talk about spirituality, we're really talking about the experiences of spirituality, uh, that phenom- uh, phenomena that can be described and then uh, experienced in a way that can be compared almost scientifically and logically as to well, what's that, what was that experience really about? So, um, and how does it fit in with human life? How does it work? Uh, so these are all great questions about spirituality. How do you prove it to oneself? And I, I say all the time that, you know, what we're discovering about spirituality now, the consensus that's building, uh, can be proved uh, to oneself because the experience is the evidence. Uh, you know, the quality of the experience, it's, it feels the same to each of us as conscious human beings. Uh, it, it, uh, it, so it's uh, there's a consensus about uh, what it means, but also how to do it, how to tune in to these higher experiences. So, you know, it's a great time to be alive in spite of our challenges out there uh, and the solution to all our challenges uh, are to uh, settle into your highest consciousness and your most uh, tune into your most guiding intuition that comes from a higher intelligence within and uh, so we're going to talk about all those experiences because really the insights that uh, I talk about in my work are, are the experiences of consciousness and of spirituality. They, they absolutely are. And, and they are, as you say, evidence-based. I mean, each one of them, we can, we can see the evidence when we're aware of them and practice them. 
So last time, you know, we talked about the first three, but so before we dig into insights four and six, can you briefly remind our audience what the first three insights are? Absolutely. And let me also say that, you know, these, these insights, you know, when you, when in the, within the word insight, uh, uh, it makes us sense or recall experiences uh, that are inspiring. So an insight is sort of a look at the world in a new way, discovering a new aspect of the world. And it's always energizing and I would argue inspiring. And I believe what's happening is that as uh, the uh, famous uh, protege of Freud, Carl Jung, uh, talked about, uh, we're, we're opening up these archetypes, which are pathways in our minds and brains that are, we're designed to open up to in the course of human evolution. Uh, so his understanding of archetypes was very, very insightful and, and, and important. And I would argue that these insights that are happening <clears throat> out there in the world uh, in, the, in, 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 pull, in lifting humanity into a higher consciousness uh, are there uh, designed within us to fire up. And they fire up one at a time. I think there's a there's a kind of beginning and beginning point, and then moving higher in consciousness as we open up all twelve of these uh, archetypal uh, revelations about life. So it's really important, I think, to uh, to understand them one at a time because they each leads into the next, uh, and and. At the end, we integrate them all into a new way of life, you know, a new daily routine uh, that's the most liberating of all and the most inspiring uh, of all once we get to that integration point. So that will be the last thing we talk about. That's the 12th insight. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, fun to uh, build up to that crescendo because in the end, it's not a matter of trying to remember insights or even trying to keep our energy level at a certain point. Uh, what we really have to do is uh, change the way we react to the world based on an old materialistic understanding and moving into a kind of higher spiritual consciousness way of life, you know, and that takes getting your sea legs and, uh, and practicing. And, but that's uh, ultimately exactly what's going to happen. So uh, let's just, let's just, again, do a review of one and two and three uh, that's on another podcast. <clears throat> the one is, the first one is the most important. It's the first pop into spirituality. Uh, it is the experience of meaningful coincidences. Now, Carl Jung called that synchronicity. Uh, but it's when you experience and are aware of uh, meaningful coincidence. It's always something in the course of your life flow. Uh, you have a hunch that you should change careers, and uh, and suddenly you uh, hear uh, on the internet or, or on a uh, from a person in the next seat on the train, you know, a, a conversation about what's really important about that particular career. Right. So what are the chances? The chances are really uh, high that you would have been thinking that way and, and you, you get on the train and there's that discussion right behind you. Now, the materialistic science uh, that rules uh, the world right now uh, would say, well, that's just an arbor, arbitrary uh, random event. It's just pure chance, means nothing. Um, but once you realize that, wait a minute, that's just, that's just a uh, short-sighted way of looking at it. The fact is it does mean something because it's a mysterious uh, coincidence that has meaning. So those, it's important to know that's the first insight because all the other insights make this flow of synchronicity. And as we'll see, the intuition that, that guides you into the place where synchronicities can happen, uh, 
so that that is uh, uh, will be evident as we go through. But synchronicity is the first step because think of it: if you're talking to an atheist and you'd explain synchronicity, uh, that person, if logical, would say, "Well, if if that's real, if we do." If somehow the, this universe is designed this way, then that means we get help in life. We get metaphysical help in life. Some kind of helping hand is in the world. Uh, some kind of higher power is guiding us or helping us uh, on this journey. Then, of course, that would point directly to some kind of a uh, higher consciousness or intuitive connection with a higher consciousness within us that's developing, you know, that would be uh, evidence, direct evidence that there is a spiritual dimension uh, to life. So the first begins there. All the others make that flow go at a faster pace and more and more deeply meaningful uh, as we go on our journey. So it immediately asks the question though, if synchronicity is real, does that mean all the people all through history that have invented all these new things that, you know, spurred this, uh, this whole wave of human evolution that recognizes more and more people uh, as equal, that, uh, that, that uh, has been behind all the the really key discoveries of human evolution, you know, this the sense that we can, we can uh, unify together, you know, in empires or nation states or the, maybe the whole world can unify. Uh, if, is that something that we're, uh, that's been going on all the time in history? So the second insight, of course, is looking at history that way. And if all if history is 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 progressive in this manner, somebody dis the Greeks discovered democracy. Before that, there was no concept of democracy. Right? This is progress that we can see. Uh, so, what that means is, of course, is if that synchronicity is real, then we all have a role in the evolution of humanity that we can discern and count on synchronicity to help us uh, engage in and then evolve into our highest position in the world that we can make a big difference in some way. Doesn't mean that all of us are gonna be famous. Most of the great work in the world was done by people working alone in anonymity, but, but, but created a new outlook on life that changed the world. Uh, so we're all together. It doesn't it has nothing to do with being famous. It has to do with finding your mission in the world that helps evolve the, uh, the world. So the aha of this insight is, my God, you know, if, if, if that's the core way we're led through in progress uh, on this world, in this world, we can discover our own gift to the world. Right. James, I have to I have to interject because today, I mean, just as uh, evidence of what you're talking about, I was thinking of one of my authors and I was thinking of something that I was debating whether I should, you know, connect and share something with one of my authors. It was just, you know, something about their book. And um, right immediately, right after I received, I had that thought, I received a text from a friend telling me that she was, you know, settling in today and on her list was to finish reading that book, which was his book. And, you know, random, we have not talked about that book in, in months. And it was just this completely random um, text that I received exactly at the moment that I thought of him. And my response to her is, this is what James Redfield would call a synchronistic event. And, uh, you know, I need to pay attention to my thoughts. And about me connecting with the author, that that is like, I feel what you're talking about, that support moving right. through, through the, through the, you know, the world of what we look for to, to help navigate and develop ourselves. That's right. So the, if the first insight is the discovery of synchronicity in one's own life, 
the second insight is uh, becoming convinced that, hey, that's the whole design of, of the human effort on this planet. And, and so uh, humanity has been getting help. We can tune into that same uh, consciousness where we find our, our journey to first discover what our mission is and then to allow that mission to unfold with our life journey. So uh, that's the second insight. Now, the third, of course, is what are the, uh, what else is in the design of this evolution going forward? Uh, and of course, we, uh, the question might be asked, what uh, is karma real? Is the success we enjoy on this, in this world um, uh, due to a karmic design that we might could figure out and, and step into and therefore have more synchronicity because of that? And I believe that we have, uh, we know exactly the, the science of spirituality has revealed the, the karmic nature uh, of this world. And uh, it essentially, as, as we covered, it's essentially uh, around helping. So if you're a helper, if you're not just paying attention to what you can get from other people, but how you can help them on their journeys, help them become a synchronicity, uh, 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 have a synchronistic moment in, in the interchange with, with you, uh, then what happens is that uh, we can more and more are givers. And if we can be givers, we draw other givers into our lives. And this can be ex not just experienced, but proved to oneself. If you consciously seek to give to every person that you encounter, not just to, not just to get from, not just to get a synchronicity from them, but to offer one as well, go into your intuition to, to think, what can I say to that person that would help? It always comes from our personal experience or the way we solved a problem. And if we get the hunch to say that to a total stranger in a conversation, sometimes we hear, a lot of times we hear, Wow, that's exactly what I needed to hear right now. Thank you so much for saying that. So that's the way that the world is designed to work, where everybody's helped. Everybody has more synchronicity because of that. Um, and uh, by the way, discovering this karmic design is, is one of the, in my views, one of the basic, most wonderful discoveries that people that the human race has ever discovered because really people have not ever tried that in mass before, but now we're starting to realize it. We can prove to ourselves that it works. We can have a luckier, happier, uh, solution after solution oriented life. Uh, and it's karmic because that's the karmic design. If we're givers now, what if we're not givers? What if we, unconsciously take it sometimes with people what if we get short of energy and we uh, seek to dominate another person to get in to win their energy and so make make ourselves feel better uh, what if we sell people things that they're that they don't need uh, you know these are all taking things that many of us uh, still do unconsciously uh, and so what happens then is if you take, you draw into your life takers that basically act exactly the way you act. Uh, because you're not a giver and a taker, you draw into your life more takers who slow your synchronicity down, mislead you. And, but it's a reflection. It's a gift. It's not a punishment. Because we can see the reflection coming back at us uh, it, it, with these takers in our lives, and it shows us us the the harm and the, that we do. Um, it's just that we have to interpret it that way. You know, if you have a taker in your life, how do I take in that certain way? Uh, now, uh, again, this is a revelation. Uh, every you know, once we again, once everybody understands how much better life goes as a giver than a taker will understand the karmic design of this world. 
and it'll become primary in our understanding of how to have a happy, creative, uh, problemless uh, life. I mean, it will still be conflicts because none of us are pure with this, but we we know how to, and we'll, we'll more know how to uh, to move past the see see that what we're maybe doing in a take unconscious taking away and move back into into giving uh, and and yeah that's the insight that's that's the basic insight to know how to get back on the light side of the giving side of life um, and interestingly uh, in order to really do that we have to move into the um, fourth insight which is what we're talking about now so uh if you're ready we'll go into that yes absolutely so for the audience the first insight is noticing synchronicity the second is the world has a spiritual design the third is giving as a karmic design and james i, I if i can have the pleasure of just announcing each insight because it's just so much fun for me um yeah. the fourth insight is uh we refer to as human control dramas and honestly this is a biggie right james i mean i don't know anyone who cannot relate or benefit from this insight well and it's and it's a it's it's a lot of fun if we don't take it personally in other words uh what happens is that we unconsciously take and it's the main thing out there that holds the world back that keeps it it keeps it from evolving faster into a more enlightened state. Uh, it's because we get hung up in power struggles. And the, so the fourth insight is, is realizing that we're taking unconsciously because of how we uh, developed a way to fight back in our childhoods. Uh, and I'm sure it's, it's, it came, uh, yeah, when we, came out came in from the afterlife uh you know it seems like we start off with a certain type of control drama as though it's it's innate uh it's genetic uh and but it's 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 time to be cleared uh you know this fourth insight brings us inspiration because it's the solution to a real basic slow down problem in terms of how fast we can evolve personally or collectively. And it works this way. <clears throat> if you're, if you're not connected uh, in the connection that we're, uh, that I'm talking about happens in the fifth insight. Okay. So we could point ahead a little bit, but if we're not connected and that's the case, if we are engaging in power struggles with other humans, uh, if we're connected, we have plenty of energy uh, within us. We're very, very secure in who we are. We're able to not ever have to defend ourselves. We just, uh, we just are with that energy, and and we can get this energy flowing through us in a giving action. Uh, so, but when we're short of energy, what happens is that you know, we run into someone who reminds us of somebody in our childhood or, or who just is, is a taker and is, is uh, taking energy. Uh, and then we have a choice to make. Do we fight back, uh, which is a taking uh, effort, which would be bad karma, uh, or do we, we deal with that control drama or that power struggle in a, in a in a way that uh, that's that diminishes it immediately. Uh, so that's that's the big insight in the the fourth insight. Uh, we all get into the power struggles. We can remember a whole childhood of one. Uh, you can go to any middle school and see the laboratory for uh, of all of the control dramas <laughs> being worked out. Uh, so it, it's, it's something that we, we grow up with. And, and if you, you can call that defending yourself, not letting anybody lower your energy. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a myth that we all, we have to stand up for ourselves and fight back, uh, and not let anybody take energy from us. 
the problem is that fighting back is actually a taking of energy from them. So these power struggles can just escalate because it's a fight against someone trying to steal our energy, we think. Uh, so let me just go over the typical ones. Uh, there, there are four that I can describe um, that uh, everybody has run into. And it's very important to know, uh, again, what these look like so that we can catch ourselves before we get drawn into a power struggle. Now, the, uh, the, and, and let's talk about them uh, from passive to aggressive. So the most passive, the most passive way is what I've called in my books, the poor me. Now the poor me is someone, and, and you, when you run into poor me, you, you, everybody can recognize that. So you, you're going somewhere and you run into a poor me and the poor me says something like, well, you know, there you are, you finally came over, but you know, you said you would call yesterday and you didn't. And, and all these things happened to me yesterday and I didn't have anybody to talk to about it. <laughs> so everybody understands that is it's the poor me and the operation is the guilt trip. So the guilt trip is, you know, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, and if we really said we'd call and didn't, then we could, we, you know, the, we, we sh should answer honestly. But usually the guilt trip is a kind of distortion of what really happened. And, but it, when we first start cell minded, I do that we kind of defer to the other person for a while and look at them in a way that gives them energy. In other words, uh, we, uh, it feels like we lose energy in front of that, but it's, it's when we give them attention though, what happens is, and this is a, this is a, an old kahuna adage that says where attention goes, energy flows. So this battle in a control drama is really about attention energy. So, you know, what happens if we face a guilt trip, we might question ourselves for a minute and then uh, realize that we're going down in energy, uh, feeling guilty. And then, then all of a sudden we think, wait a minute, that's not how it happened. I never promised to call her yesterday. And then you say, I did not do that. Yes, you did. No, you didn't. So there's the power struggle operating out there. So what do you do, though? And I'm going to say that. I'm going to, what do you do in that situation that does not get you in a power struggle? You say exactly what you are feeling. In other words, what you want to do is get the, instead of a game playing situation, you want to get it back to a authentic conversation. So you first have to go authentic and what, what that requires, and this is heroic in a way, what that requires, instead of fighting back and saying, no, I didn't, you say, you know, right now I feel guilt tripped and that's called naming the game. Now <clears throat> you have to be diplomatic the way you do that, but it's, better to just say, here's, you know, here's what I feel right now. I feel like you're uh, guilt tripping me. And what happens to the other person is they then have to look at the, the game and it's, you name the game and it forces everyone to look at, at this game that's being played. It's not an authentic. And, and once you get that person to start to look that way, it, they go authentic. They may fight back, argue, no, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, or you needed it, or anything, <laughs> anything that you deserved it. Yeah, anything they might say, you don't ever respond to that. What you do is you say, well, that's just how I feel. And you're safe there because even if you're distorting, maybe you, you're forgotten the situation or whatever, but it, in order to, you're never going to get it resolved until you can diffuse that that power struggle. And so you name the game at the same time you give energy. 
Now, the giving of energy is the fourth, I mean, the eighth insight, but, but you know, we, we can describe what that is at this point. And that is, you give energy by looking at, for the expression on their face to go authentic, to go uh, centered, to go conscious at, a diff- at an- another level. So you try to see the consciousness uh, authentic consciousness in the, in the person that you're giving energy to. And that attention fills you up first. So you, you no longer feel like you're being drained because, you know, as you, as we'll see, you, you just, as you give that with love, what happens is that it fills you up and centers you in every way and then spills over on them. Right. You know what, James, I just want to, say that for the people listening that may say i couldn't say that made me feel guilt tripped for an example because maybe the dynamic and the human control drama is is out of balance to a great degree and and in many relationships they are what i will offer is that the practicing of all of the insights the really the roadmap that the the 12 insights of the celestine vision offer provides the foundation, provides the support to be able to navigate and balance out, you know, these relationships and, and, and these dramas, you know, so even if right now someone could say, I could never say that because that would create such a problem with, with a person. Um, I'll just offer that with all of the insights, practicing them all, that that will, that will absolutely shift um, for them. Well, you know the as we'll see with all these with all these insights um you know that they build upon one another and uh and then you come back around to really being able to practice them all the time but the the more we can give energy the person is guilt tripping us because they need energy they're so short they have to they have to win it from another person by guilt tripping them all the time they need to win that attention, force that attention to themselves. So, you know, what, what you, the first thing is most important is to give the energy, even if you need to change the topic of conversation, but if you're giving energy, you can, you can, uh, you know, you can be uh, free enough yourself because you're filling up at the same time. And again, that, that takes some practice. Uh, none of these things are, uh, simple. They're simple, but they're not easy at first. They take practice. And, but what we're talking about is optimizing our lives. And there's nobody who's in a relationship that's characterized by guilt trips is happy. Uh, and the, the more that, that they can help get that, put that issue on the table to whatever degree feels comfortable, the faster we can all get liberated from the, from these control dramas, but you're exactly true what you say, especially as you get into more aggressive control dramas and having to deal with them. But let's just go on and, and, and show you the model. Uh, let's say uh, that in, again, the second one I'll mention is uh, not to poor me, but is slightly less uh, passive in its approach. And that is the aloof. Now, the aloof person, the, uh, dis, uh, the, the person who doesn't disclose, uh, we've all, all known these people. So you, you know, you're, you're interacting and you say something like, well, what'd you do last night? And you get, oh, I went out. And you go, well, where'd you go? And uh, you might get, well, you know, I, I went to a couple of places downtown. <laughs> You know, so you, what do you, what you, so you feel that, uh, that situation, you know, and it's a, it's a drama being played out. In other words, the drama is they're withholding information. So you will give them energy as you ask more questions about it. So that's the, that's this, uh, the, the strategy uh, of the aloof. Uh, you see that. Uh, lots of times in in uh, these little dances in, in 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 relationships, you know, where the 
the male is aloof and the, uh, the female uh, searches for the, you know, the, the real person there, you know? So again, though, the, we do the exact same thing. We uh, shift when that starts to happen, we feel it, we give it energy, let it flow through us and into the other person. And you look for a higher consciousness on the, on the look on the face of the person. Uh, and you say, you name the game, you say, you know, you don't just, I just feel like you don't disclose in this, in this interaction, you know, you're just, uh, given you don't really give, uh, and allow me to know you because that's the truth and the truth always makes the uh the relation the, the interaction go authentic and again all you have to say is this that's that's how i feel when i'm talking to you and the person will argue or whatever they got they're gonna do but you just go back well that's just how i feel about it now the the thing about that is that you're giving that you're helping them. Okay. This is a help. If you don't tell the truth, then you're not helping. You don't have to be hit them on, on you know, you don't get angry and say it. You, you do it with love every time. And what happens is that we get, uh, even if they don't accept it, I just, that's crazy. I'm not even going to think about that. And they, they, you know, don't talk to you anymore for a while. You just let that go because they will still, they will, as, as consciousness rises in the, in the world, they will get, they will hear that from more and more people. And if you've, you've planted the seed and, and you've done your, you're giving them that gift. Um, so uh, that's, again, that, that is a part of your giving. If you don't give that, uh, because it's too much trouble or you're afraid or whatever, you know, you just have to do the best you can because it's a part of giving and you want to be a giver if you want your life to flow. And, uh, because that's the design. Now let's go on a little further and we'll go into more aggressive types with these control dramas. And again, we all, I have to always say we have to, take the edge off all this. I mean, everybody has a control drama and everybody's too sensitive and we have to laugh at ourselves while we're bringing this into the consciousness of the world uh, because it's an immediate resolution of control dramas and we know how to do it. I mean, it, that, that, that information has come into uh, to the, the human knowledge uh, and we're we we know that this is the way to deal with a control uh, a power struggle in the world. And once we start to practice it, uh, give intention to it, uh, what happens is that that you'll have success with doing this. Uh, more aggressive is the interrogator. Okay, now you know you've run into an interrogator field, the round of an interrogator is when you, you, you start, come in, start a conversation, and the person habitually finds something wrong with you. Something about how you say something, something about how you're dressed, something about what you didn't do already, uh, something, uh, just a criticism. Now, what happens in criticisms? They, their strategy is, if I can find something wrong with you, you will defer to me. And that's exactly what happens. If you're around a, what, an interrogator who, who wins energy by putting people down in subtle ways, you know, you are in a power struggle where that person's strategy is to, is to find something wrong so that they can then have you give your attention to them. Uh, uh, sometimes you, uh, begin, if you're around an interrogator a lot, what you do is you, you're on your tiptoes all the time. So you said, okay, what, have, what have I done wrong here that they're going to criticize me about? Let's, uh, let me find out, am I dressed okay? You know, how should I talk to them? You know, 
when you do that, you're, they get your attention and they get your energy. Uh, but it's a control drama. You know, it's, it's a strategy to win over, to force people to give them energy. Again, what's the solution? Name the game. When I'm with you, I always feel criticized. Give them love. Say it in a loving way. If you say it in anger, it's just another control drama back. Say it with love, and it it will diffuse the situation and make it go authentic. Yeah, they can argue or whatever they want to do. You just keep stay, stick to your guns. Well, that's just how I feel when I'm around you. And then the mo- most aggressive is the fourth one. Uh, that is the intimidator. The intimidator wins energy from put people by f- scaring them into paying attention to them. So the way that works, uh, we all know intimidators. They walk in a room and you can feel it. They have a kind of domineering, you know, I'm the person you should be worried about. I might go off at any moment. You know, people sense that, 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 and that's the one you have to be most, uh, obviously most, um, careful with, uh, you know, when, when you have, uh, you know, families, uh, where there's abuse, that's what's going on. There's an intimidator there. And that, that's when you should withdraw in my view. Uh, otherwise you have to say, to them uh, lovingly you're you know you've you've you just you're intimidating you're trying to scare me you're always looking wild or about to blow up and and of course again you know sometimes withdrawal is the best case for this um so but that's that's the four that that you know that's just the, the typical four uh, that I always like to mention, and, and there's variations a little bit, but those are the four categories uh, that 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 one can look for in control control dramas. And again, the whole idea is to awaken the world to these, and the only way to do it is to name the game, give love and energy because that's what they want in the first place. Give them energy try to make the conversation go authentic by naming the game. And you know, the, the beautiful part about your best-selling book, The Celestine Prophecy, is that it's written in story. And so these control dramas, and they kind of play out in the story. And, and you really can get a real sense, even, you know, in addition to the beautiful explanation you just gave, but when you can see it in character, and reactions and what's happening, it really makes it clear, you know, what's happening. And I know reading, rereading the Celestine Prophecy recently, as I was reading through the control drama parts in the story, I was like, oh, okay, I, you know, I, you know, and I could see myself, you know, or situations in my life, you know, so, so much, so clearly based on, you know, reading it in the story of others. You know, this might be a time to, uh to really talk a little bit about the, uh, the new edition of the Celestine Prophecy uh, that I uh, have, have uh, the publisher, my publisher has uh, put together. I wrote a long afterward. And this, is, this, this particular edition is, is really meant for everybody, uh, but particularly the two new generations, uh, hence the afterward, where I really talked about you know, putting this stuff into practice, what we know now in terms of how is the best way to do that. Uh, and it gives them a little bit more information. It's not just a book about a story. It's a book about uh, awakening and uh, awakening to what's really going on in the world and the spiritual design behind the world. Uh, so the you know, afterward is really important. I'm, I always like to say to people, we're, we're trying to get this, this, particular book uh, in the hands of people who need it, especially the two younger generations. Uh, I always uh, like to say as well, you know, uh, the 
the millennials especially, but also the, the their children are reading the uh, the Celsian prophecy at new levels again uh, because they're asking the big questions. And so I would just, uh, you know, if you've got a, a couple of copies of the Celsian prophecy on your, on your shelf, you know, give it to a millennial, you know, give it, give it to a college student, uh, you know, pass, pass the book around because again, it's about consciousness and there's no greater time than right now to understand how to move into a more creative, uh, more in tune and in, in intuitively uh, in, in a more flow of synchronicity, uh, that level of consciousness, because there's so much meditation going on. Uh, the world looks, the materialistic world looks like a bunch of people screaming at them at each other. Uh, and people want to seek an alternative to that. And, uh, so that's why I'm out with this book and encouraging that people pass their books around to, to these two new generations. And I, I wholeheartedly agree. And it's why we're doing the series that we're doing, you know, because it, you know, it's time. It really is time. And it's, it's encouraging. Like we talked about in the previous interviews that collectively, we have all helped with our conscious choices and conscious actions. We have all helped create this new time together. So, so we can continue to bring it forward. So that's right. And uh, again, we're also on my website, cell, uh, dot com, or you can just Google James Redfield. It'll come up. We really, uh, are, trying, are putting together and we have it operating, uh, uh a mentor, uh, situation, a mentoring uh, system program uh, so that people can find mentors to act as so sounding boards for them uh, and and really uh, a point of discussion about getting through control dramas or whatever it is that you, you're, you're pursuing at this point, uh, how, to, how to put all this to work in your career, uh, how to break through to a new career how to become more creative in something you want to, to, to establish. So we have, we have mentoring and coaching available uh, on the website for people that want, want a, a high speed uh, feedback on how they're doing in, in this kind of personal evolution. So we, we felt like that was necessary uh, and, and we, we could feel that need. And so pass the word around about that. There, there, you know, we, we have college students who are on a journey suddenly uh, who'll come in for uh, some mentoring or, or coaching. Uh, so we're trying to trying to make this available to as many people as possible at the lowest possible cost. Yeah, that's wonderful. So CelestineVision.com, we encourage everyone to go to. James, we have two more insights to talk about today, the fifth and the sixth. So we've, yeah. we've, we've covered the first four. Um, the fifth is titled The Spiritual Connection. Can you share about that? Well, the solution to the energy issue altogether is the fifth insight. So uh, we're all uh, operating at less than an optimal amount of inspiration and energy and flow of synchronicity because we're only now uh, tuning in uh, to the, the, the full intuitive intelligence that we have. And that happens through a kind of contemplation. Uh, you call it prayer uh, uh, contemplation. Uh, you call it a meditation but it's a quietness with oneself uh, and it's absolutely the solution that has been known forever across multi religions. Uh, it is the uh, metaphysical, even miraculous uh, place where you're given peace that is beyond all understanding. Uh, this is, you know, in the materialistic world, uh, that we uh, live in, unfortunately, uh, scientists and others will scoff at such a notion uh, that we can be uh, transformed uh, inside in terms of our level of security and energy 
uh, just by uh, uh, a kind of repeated intention and asking for this. Uh, but I don't, I don't cut this short. I don't underestimate this. This is a miraculous kind of procedure that, again, you can prove to yourself works. Uh, you just have to practice it uh, and make it an aspect of your life. So <clears throat> this is, you know, and again, I, I, just want to, I just want to say that one more time. Don't underestimate the power of this. Uh, when I say it's a new time in the world, that there's never been more consciousness in the world, it's because more people are meditating in the world. And I believe that we most prove it to ourselves to work in a certain, doing it in a certain manner. And I just want to quickly describe what that is. All meditation, you sit with yourself alone, uh, uh, with your eyes closed, at least at first. Uh, and you seek mindfulness, which really means a quiet mind, right? And that's the, the key of uh, the basis of all the meditation and the mindfulness meditation uh, that's happening out there. I sometimes call it a contemplation because uh, it's the intention to get in connection with a higher source of consciousness meaning uh, the source, the, the, the higher intelligence within which, which we're in contact with. Uh, it feels like a part of us at the level that we contacted. Uh, and I think there are only a few um, special steps into this uh, that I'd like to uh, talk about. Uh, one is intend to have an heart opening now anyone who's felt love uh toward a child toward a uh the parents in, in our memories uh toward uh our first uh, that we can remember when our, our first crush of love as an adolescent uh the heart opening it happens when we we recall departed loved ones you know this is a real this is something that we can experience right in our heart re region it's a solar plexus popping uh you know maybe eastern philosophy describes it best it's a a, a wave of energy that comes into us it's a it's a firing up of our chakras but that doesn't matter. Every religion has a word for it uh, and a, and a uh, different ways to find it. Uh, but I believe if, if we go in and have the mantra around our intention, we want to open up our heart and feel this love connection. You know, if, you know, God, God is love is a, is, is written in all the sign the, the, songs and, and, and poetry because it's, it's a real experience that we can have. Uh, so, uh, you know, the materialists out there make it sound syrupy and naive and, uh, you know, not the best way to carry yourself in the world. The world's too hard for people who love. That's all nonsense and defense mechanisms going off in materialistic people. Just know that this is our birthright. This is an archetypal opening that can happen. And I believe that the, the way this uh, is, can best be done is by uh, sitting alone. Like any other mindfulness meditation, we, if whatever we start thinking about why well, we shouldn't be there, we don't have time for this, I'm afraid to sit by myself, I, I, I hate being by myself. It, you know, it, all that comes in. And at the first, you know, two weeks, those will be the things that come in. This is a waste of time. This is crazy. I hate it. Intend that you move through that phase or you will quit. But just stay with it. And stay with it because you want the emotion of love. Think about all the times you've ever loved 
and just try to feel that again without any object. You know, you can think of that departed loved one and I know your heart will open. And when it opens, you can feel this love again, but it shouldn't be as an object toward anything or anybody. It's a state of love. Let me say that again. It's a state, state of love. This is our master emotion. It's our only spiritual emotion. Uh, And it, once you start practicing that, it becomes bigger. So you're letting go. Every time you're interrupted by a thought or another emotion, a lower emotion that's not love, just you come back to your center, back to your uh, intention to find a love and a peaceful space, a love connection, and you keep coming back. We'll have emotional eruptions. You'll, you'll, Think about how many times you've been hurt in the world and who did it and what you should have done about it. Or anger will come up. Why is the world the way it is? Why are we facing these these worldwide challenges all of a sudden? And it'll just, lower emotions will come up. But the more you practice, the more your lower emotions are healed. The more they come up, bounce off this love uh, center that you have. That's a higher consciousness. That's a blessing. Call it a, a natural opening of an archetype, whatever you want to call it. But it is real. And if you practice it, it will be given to you. So I always say it just like that because there's no doubt in my mind that it's available to anybody who stays through the first two weeks <laughs> of practicing it. Uh, and, and, you know, you're, it, it, it's liberating because the more that you let go of all these lower thoughts and emotions and you come back to your intention and open and find that state of love and hold it for 20 minutes, the more you can wake up, walk out on your path in life and you are living more and more in that consciousness. It centers you in your energy. It gives you the power of love. You know, week after week, it builds. And then you center, you become the star of your own movie. You're not running away from these lower emotions with some coping device. That's been healed. And you, you know, love is how you operate. An emotion that you have. And it's the strongest most wise emotion you can ever carry in your body. It's not fluff and syrupy and what silly people do. It's an immense power that you can use to center in yourself. So you have to have this, this wisdom and this intuitive guidance. And again, that's what comes in. Once you're not thinking about your coping devices and get back to them and you open up this heart and uh, in love, you know, what happens is that your mind opens. And what you get is not chatter about what you should have done yesterday and how unworthy you are or anything else. What you get is a guiding intuition at every step of the way in your life. Now, nothing less than that is, is what you should settle for. Uh, but it's, again, something we do as an individual choice, but it's, it's, unbelievably transforming it, and it is definitely something to work for right because we're talking about living in the div- ultimately divine flow right grace and ease and and collectively creating that new world together right james that's right and again the more people practicing what we're talking about here the more enlightened the world at, in, in, at large becomes. And in, in this space where we're are listening to our guiding intuitions, flowing with synchronistic opportunities, that's the optimal flow in life that is our birthright. And we're getting to it at this moment in history. And that, that's pretty exciting to me. 
Yeah, absolutely. And like with all the other insights, one leads to the next. And the sixth one, the, the final one we'll be discussing today is sensing a life mission, which I think many of us have, have had that inner, you know, through millennia, that inner questioning, that inner yearning for what is our, what is our mission? What is our purpose? Right? That's what we all long for. That's the missing part of our lives. Uh, that's, that's what we all strive for. It's what our coping devices are there to, to help us forget because it's so, you know, we only now begun to realize how we can open up to this mission in life. And of course it happens in meditation. And, and remember that once you meditate, you start to live that same state, love, guiding intuition coming in in your normal life. And what happens is you get an intuition to help every, wherever you walk in this life. There will be people that are waiting for you to say something about your life experience and what you do, how you've handled past events. Uh, and so every, every encounter then is a part of your mission unfolding because here's the way it works. You will be given guiding intuitions to say things to people uh, out of the blue, you know, and they'll, and it'll be received well most of the time, especially when it's given with love. But you will notice that these intuitions have a certain area of life that they pertain to, right? It could be about health understanding. It could be about uh, any of the professions in the whole world. You just kind of lean toward that being the thing that comes to you, that you're interested in, that you study and read about. That's how you know uh, what it is that you need to be doing in the world. It, your, your intuitions will show you what you're good at. It's a talent. And then you'll, you can go back in your past, and that's what has to happen in the sixth insight. It'll go, you'll, you can go back in your path and, and, and just think about all the synchronicities that have happened and the hunches that you used uh, to go talk to this stranger or to sit in a, per, a, a seat, a, per, a particular seat on the airplane uh, that resulted in a synchronicity and you can chart your life path and ask the question what was i what have i been prepared to do what's the knowledge base that my experience in life has prepared me to help other people with that gives you your first clue of your unfolding mission and you know i i tend to believe that one never gets a you never completely understand your mission you just refine it so that, you know, it's always going to be intuitive. You can find a place to make a living where you use that kind of information. But it'll all, always be the, the, what you do one-to-one. -one. I mean, before I wrote any of these books, and, and some people say, you know, maybe the best work I, I really have, I, I did, the most important work that I've done, was I was a, I was a spiritual counselor. Uh, for, for years, working with teenagers, working with adults, families, couples, you know, applying all this because of my understanding of growth, but, uh, you know, working one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and, and that may have been the, the most important touching those people that way. Uh, because, uh, you know, many went on to do some very inspiring things. But so it's not about being famous, right? It's not about writing a book always. It's not about doing, starting a big company. It's not about that. It's about getting in your flow of helping. You know, maybe what you do with your grandchildren is the most important thing that could possibly be done with your life. Um, it, it's all at, you know, at the inspiring level for individuals. But don't think that if you don't, write a great book, you haven't completed your mission. You know, start off at the level of what you say to individuals. Uh, because that, if we were all doing that, 
And I think you can see if we were all living these insights, then the world would change very, very quickly. So the, the sixth insight then is very, very important in that it, that you have to know that once you've opened up your consciousness and you, you, you move in love and synchronicity and following your intuitions, you're going to have that revealed to you in real time with real people. And if you already know that, okay, well this, I've got the ideal job in my mind uh, already, then go for that. Go for that. Get trained. Get in that job. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're in a corporation that, that, that uh, you know, you can uh, work your way into a position where you are where you're supposed to be and you can enlighten uh, that world the best, stay there. Don't think you have to go and do something on your own if you don't want to. Get in an organization of any kind, but but make it, you'll find the one and you'll be led to the one. That's the thing. We don't have to figure all this out ourselves. All we have to do is, is take these steps that we're guided to, to take and the synchronicity will reveal it all for us and we'll wind out up right where we need to be in life to help the most people. Yeah, you know, James, uh, I have to say, I, I agree a thousand percent. You know, I, I'm an ordained interfaith minister and after spending two years in seminary, the biggest question people had is, you know, well, how do I use this? I'm, I'm a minister now, but I can't necessarily leave my job maybe and become a, you know, start my own spiritual business or become a ceremonial minister or something like that. And they really felt like they really were called to go to seminary and then, you know, use it as the mission. And, and our deans, I remember it was just so clearly, they said, you know, it is who you are, wherever you are. So if you're working in corporate America, you know, you bring your your consciousness you know if you're an administrative assistant be the most conscious administrative assistant you can you know in every aspect of our lives we can live our mission we, it doesn't have to be defined by a certain title um that we think we have to have and and i and i and i think that goes right along with what you're saying right absolutely <clears throat> and um again uh you know, find a group, find a group, uh, discuss all this with people. Uh, we're, we're creating a community at selsingvision.com just for this kind of talk and, uh, and re reinforcement and sharing. Uh, but it's, it's just the, it's just what's next to really find places and groups of people that can be supportive of living life this way. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Community, spiritual community is, I think, the next evolution of our consciousness, you know, really absolutely living that. So CelestineVision.com, where James has created an online mentoring and, and uh, group program. So audience, just to, just to review just for a moment, because the discussion has been so rich. James started with reviewing the first three insights, which is noticing synchronicity. The world has a spiritual design giving the karmic design and that was where we went in depth with that with the previous episode and this episode james really uh went into depth on human control dramas which is the fourth the spiritual connection which is the fifth and the sixth which we just discussed sensing a life mission next episode we will cover the seven through nine insights so stay tuned for those that will be following your intuition giving energy, which we've talked about a few times. That's really, that one blew me away when I reread the Celestine Prophecy because there's ways to do it that really can't take you out of your mental body and fulfilling human destiny. So James Redfield, this is just an absolute delight and it's been such a pleasure to have you on Not This, Not That again, uh, discussing the Celestine Vision and the, the 12 Insights. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's a lot of fun for me. Again, we're, we're trying to create some systems that will help people with it. Anybody who wants to contact me uh, after hearing this, uh, I, would, I would be available uh, uh, to, to converse about it, especially in mentoring. 
uh, we offer a free, uh, a free, actually 30 minute uh, discovery call uh, just to make sure that who, who is coming in uh, knows what is in store and, and is, is clear about it and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, the main thing is to share all this, uh, share it with your friends, share it with your kids, share it with your parents. Uh, it's, you know, there's a, there's a, the road opening ahead is either one of, of uh, a, a, a joining a collapsing darkness out there that is uh, not aware of, of spiritual reality uh, and, and moving into the light side of life where you're a giver, uh, you're, you're reaping the rewards of good, good karma and high inspiration living. And uh, again, that's where, that's where we're going. Uh, everybody who's in fear in, in any kind of corruption, uh, they, they really want, you know, that's, they're operating at ego out of fear, but really what they really want is this kind of lived spirituality because that's human destiny. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're with you, James. And, and I encourage everyone, um, to join you as well. So CelestineVision.com. And again, the Celestine Prophecy is on your shelf. Share it. You know, many people I speak to, you know, they've read it um, when it first was a bestseller in the 90s. And it's and the younger generations are picking it up and, and possibly, you know, pick up the new version because James has written a beautiful afterword that, you know, that's really wonderful as well. So um, James Redfield, the Celestine Prophecy, Prophecy, CelestineVision.com. Thank you again, James, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for spreading the word. And thank you to our audience. Once again, this is the third of actually five interviews with James. Um, so stay tuned for the next two coming up to round out the all of the insights. You've been listening, uh, as we've mentioned, to Not This, Not That. And I'm your host, Reverend Patricia Caginello. And so until next time. Uh, be well, and I will say read the Celestine Prophecies.